everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to today's webinar on the approach to analysis of FMIS and EEG data. I'm Patrick, the general manager here with uh, NIREX GmbH. And um, another very exciting webinar for me. Last week, we had one which belongs to this one, where we talked about the integration of where software to make a uh, combined EEG FNIS recording easy. And we had Alexander von Luhrmann speak on it and Marty, a consultant from our team. And we had David Medina here, who Dr. David Medina, who is one of the masterminds of LSL. And I made the point also last time that uh, why do we have two devices and integrate one? Do we not give you just one little box that does everything? And it was um, and it was also brought up in the questions where how do I configure it? Yes, we want to give you all the flexibility so you can use whatever EEG system fits your research needs, whatever FNIS platform fits your research needs. And then we work together with our partners to make it as easy as possible for you to record those data. And uh, if you're interested to see how it was done or how it is done, the webinar is on a YouTube channel. And there were, uh, it was in the early morning, so maybe European times. So maybe you hadn't had the chance to go there and what, uh, ask questions to David. Um, so we will have another Q&A session with David uh, coming up, which you can also register for and we'll keep you updated where you then can ask your questions. Anyways, um, back to today, when I quickly introduce um, us as a company, we are, uh, oh, wait, my slide second um we are since 20 years providing solutions hardware and software um for nears research and um we're a small company based uh, most of our team in berlin where we really invent uh, design manufacture support those devices and we have offices also in north america but obviously we support our research community worldwide um today i think I would like to uh, introduce um, our guest speaker with um, great enthusiasm. I'm very, very happy you're here. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry for the mistake here. Uh, first, our moderator, Ashling Casey from our North American support team is today your moderator and make sure that all your questions get heard and will lead us uh, through the webinar. She is, uh, biomedical engineer and very well experienced with uh, FNIRS research. Um, and yeah, so I I could say that you are with the NIH, right? And you, I, but I'm missing all your background. You have done quite a lot in the FNIRS uh, research. So um, it's my honor to introduce you, Dr. Ted Hubbard. Thanks so much for being here with us today and sharing your knowledge. Um, for the few that don't know uh, Dr. Ted Hubbard, not yet already, he's a principal investigator at the Hubbard Lab and a faculty member of the electrical and computer engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. He has ordered more than 70 peer reviewed papers but, and, and below it says founding member of the FNIRS uh, society. More importantly, somebody who has FNIRS at heart and pushes the field and shares his knowledge all the time, very willingly and enables so many other FNIRS researchers. So while there are 70 publications to your name, there are hundreds of publications that you enabled by teaching people and providing the tools and sharing those tools. And we are very, very grateful to have you here again. And being here to share your knowledge again. Thanks so much for being here. Ashley, I'll hand to you. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so I just have a couple of uh, webinar considerations to share. You are muted, uh, we can't see you, um, but questions are welcome at any time. Um, please use the Q&A uh, panel in the GoToWebinar um, little pop-up there, and you can submit questions throughout the webinar, and um, we will have a Q&A session at the end to try and answer as many as we can. Content will be available on our website um, following the uh, completion of the webinar, and within the next few days, we'll have the recording of this webinar and slides available um, so you can review everything that we've shared. If you have any further questions after the webinar, please send an email to consulting at nearx.net. 
okay analysis resources for NEARS Toolbox. So um, the NEARS Toolbox is Dr. Hubbard's analysis platform. Um, we did specify in the webinar information leading up that we wouldn't be covering introductory material here. We really want to just jump right into XNIRS and EEG analysis in the toolbox. Um, but we do have plenty of resources to get you started with NEARS toolbox if you're not uh, familiar. So I just wanted to point those out. Um, for NEARX end users, you can sign up for our support site if you're not signed up already. Um, and we do have a dedicated um, NEARS toolbox page with lots of resources to get you started like slides and, and, and um, scripts and videos and such. So that's going to be a great resource to get you started. Um, but if you're not a NEARX end user, um, we do have videos publicly available on our YouTube channel. Um, just recently in April, we did two videos, um, one by myself and the other by Dr. Huppert, um, walking through um, analysis in the NEARS toolbox. So those are going to be helpful for everyone. And that's all. I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Huppert now. All right, let me figure out how to show my screen. Oops, how do I switch? Sorry about that, swap displays. Okay, there we are. So, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Ted Huppert. I am uh, an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, recently moved over to the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, from the Department of Radiology. And um, I've been at uh, Pittsburgh for, I think, 14 years now. And what my lab does is primarily data analysis methods. We have developed, uh, originally when I was a student under David Boas at Harvard, I uh, developed the Homer 1 and then Homer 2 platforms. Uh, since moving to Pittsburgh, we've developed our own uh, newer toolbox called the Nearest Toolbox, um, because I'm not very creative with names. And um, mostly this toolbox is centered around a Nears analysis. Um, but we also have a number of tools in it for doing fMRI, for doing MEG, and for doing EEG analysis as, as well. Um, as well as multimodal analysis uh, when we combine multiple uh, modalities together and develop methods for analyzing data um, jointly. And so what I'd like to talk today about is uh, some of the tools and methods that we have in the toolbox for doing uh, particularly EEG combined with uh, NEARS uh, data analysis. So I wanted to actually, I, I'm going to show uh, some of the features actually in the toolbox and show how to, to, to make the call um, function calls, and I'll bring up MATLAB. Um, but I wanted to actually walk through a bit some of the reasons uh, or main themes for using EEG in our NEARS analysis um, and kind of show some of the work that we've done um, uh, to demonstrate how these methods get used. And so what I'm going to walk through today is um, basically three different ways to use uh, NEARS EEG. Um, the first is going to be cross-validation, um, using the two modalities to kind of uh, prove that they both relate to each other um, and, and kind of do that cross-validation. Then I'm going to move into some of the research uh, dating back to my PhD thesis um, uh, about modeling these relationships. So, so, so both EEG and NEARS obviously say things about the brain, um, but in different ways. One is electrophysiological, one is hemodynamic. And how do you start to put those together in model-based approaches uh, to understand how these things relate to each other? And how can you use those model-based approaches to analyze your NEARS EEG data? So, so very much a, uh, um, a top-down approach um, in terms of starting with a physiological model and then um, relating it to your, your NEARS or EEG data uh, to infer things about the model. And then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, purely statistical ways for combining NEARS and, and EEG. These are two methods that measure the brain activity. They are related in some way, but rather than defining that relationship on the basis of biology or physiology, defining that on the basis of statistics. And so um, introducing methods like joint image reconstruction, joint statistical inference, 
uh, to try to combine NIRS EEG to get uh, simply a better estimate of brain statistical brain activity. So let's start off with the idea of cross-validation. It's the simplest uh, to, to really think about. And so one of the things that's nice about both NIRS and EEG um, is that they're compatible with other modalities. So today we're going to talk about the combination of NIRS and EEG together, but obviously you can do NIRS inside of an MRI. Um, as you see on the right here, you can do NIRS inside of an MEG. Um, a magnetoencephalography MEG is very similar to EEG in that it measures neural activity. Um, and we can use fiber optics and make our nearest measurements inside of an MEG. Likewise, we can do the same things with EEG. We can do EEG fMRI, we can do EEG mag, we can do EEG nears. Um, and as you'll see in a couple slides, we can even start to do things like MRI, nears, and EEG at the same time uh, to try to put all these things uh, together to learn something about the brain. So that's exactly uh, where I'm going to start. It was a study that was done um, going back maybe seven years ago in, in my lab that one, uh, my grad student, Ben Schmidt, um, set out to, to start recording uh, NIRS and other modalities. And what our goal was, we, was, we wanted to understand the relationships between all these different modalities. If we want to define a physiological model, we need to make sure that our data is consistent with that model. Is it consistent with this idea of neural activity driving these vascular parameters and, and, and so on? Um, and so we need to kind of understand the uh, those processes and the un the underlying assumptions and, and so on related to those 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 models. So what Ben set out to do was to collect simultaneous NIRS data, and we actually collected it in two sessions. We collected NIRS with MEG, um, which you see on the right, and as I said, is very similar to how EEG works and it measures neural activity in the brain. And then we also collected in session number two, we collected NIRS inside of an MRI scanner along with EEG. So we did simultaneous NIRS MRI EEG in session one, and then we did simultaneous NIRS MEG in session two. So, so we ended up collecting a total of 15 subjects. Um, because of the um, we'll say limitations of doing multimodal data. We ended up actually finishing the study with about 11. We lost, and actually we started with closer to 20 to 25. Um, so we ended up losing about half of our subjects because when you do so many different modalities, in this case, we're doing four different modalities, uh, the chances of one of them failing in one of your sessions is pretty high. Right, so sometimes the MRI scanner would be down, sometimes the MEG scanner would be down, sometimes the NIRS just didn't work. Um, in the case of MEG, uh, as you can see, basically the person sits with their head in this, um, this little helmet thing, it's a hard plastic helmet. Um, inside of the helmet is where the, the, the MEG sensors are. And you have to be careful because that helmet is designed to fit 95% of the population in terms of their head size. But once you put the fiber optics and NIRS in there, now maybe it's only about 50% of the population. And so uh, a lot of those subjects that we lost that we couldn't do the, the, the study on were because they physically didn't fit in the MEG scanner once we put NIRS on their head. Um, and, and so doing multiple modalities like this is actually really challenging. The more modalities you add, the more challenging and more um, subject loss you're going to have, the more att uh, attrition you're going to have. But at the end of the day, we managed to successfully collect 15 subjects in all of these modalities. Of those 15 subjects, I think four of them um, we ended up uh, having to discard because of low uh, signal issues. So we ended up with a total of 11 uh, subjects in the end. And what we asked the subjects to do in this um, experiment was what's called a median nerve task. So it's a, um, a, a your median nerve is the, the nerve that runs up kind of the center of your, your, your arm here out kind of towards your thumb. And it's, it's, um, it's a favorite of EEG and MEG 
um, studies because the median nerve is so close to the surface of the skin that you can put an electrode on it and apply a, a very small electrical current and actually stimulate the nerve to, to fire. And so what this allows you to do is um, basically introduce a somatosensory uh, um, um, task. Um, it's this electrical stimulation of, of the nerve. Uh, it doesn't hurt. It feels a little weird because your thumb starts to twitch. Um, but it's well known from the EEG, MEG, uh, to light up your somatosensory cortex. Uh, very localized contralateral activation to your somatosensory cortex. Uh, and it's actually one of the strongest signals that we can measure with uh, MEG and, and EEG in terms of, of the, the brain response. And so we, we chose this, this task um, because we knew it gave good MEG and EEG uh, results. And we wanted to um, then compare the NEARS uh, and the fMRI to the EEG and the MEG. Now, in terms of experimental design, um, Obviously, with EEG and MEG, they're fast, uh, you know, electrophysiological signals. So that median nerve task, that that zap, is over and done in a few hundred milliseconds. In the case of the NEARS uh, and fMRI, you probably couldn't see a single zap, right? You'd have to have lots of zaps kind of compounding to really drive the hemodynamic response to the level that we could actually measure it. And so we had to kind of compromise in the experimental design, having an, a design that worked for both the NEARS MRI and also for the EEG. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up doing two tasks. We did a localizer task, which was a 10 second on off um, um, stimulation. And the NEARS and the fMRI analyzed it as this block design. 10 seconds compared to the 10 second rest period and so on. The EEG MEG analyzed it in terms of each individual stimulus event, each event coming in at every 250 milliseconds for that 10 seconds. Um, so the EEG ends up with a lot more events, individual events than the fMRI or the, or the NEARS. Uh, but this kind of design works then for both analyzing with the fMRI and with the, or the NEARS and the EEG. We also did, uh, so, so that was the localizer task. This, this block design gives us uh, a lot of power to localize it spatially. We then also did what's called a pulse pair experiment. So the pulse pair experiment was uh, a media nerve in which we present two zaps, zap, zap. And the idea is you change the interval between the two zaps. And the reason we did this, oops, um, the, the, uh, the reason we did this is because, um, I'll show in a later slides, that there was a, an old paper by Seji Agawa that had done this in, in rats and in rodents and showed that you could use this inner stimulus interval to basically probe the neural uh, refractory period. So when these events were, too clo were really close, zap, zap, the second zap, uh, basically, uh, the first zap came in, the neurons responded, the second zap came in and the neurons couldn't respond because they were in that neural refractory period. As So basically, the, you didn't get a response to the second zap. As the inner stimulus interval increased, now they started to act independently so that at uh, 400, 500 milliseconds, they were now independent events uh, again. And so what Seji Agawa's group had shown was that you could use this to probe this neural refractory period. And if you looked at the hemodynamic response, in that case, in fMRI, it showed very similar kind of uh, this dip where the, you were having neural, uh, this, the, in the neural refractory period. So we wanted to kind of replicate that experiment that had been done in rodents in humans to show that, again, NEARS and EEG uh, agreed with each other to basically see these these um, these events. So the experiment, as I said, was simultaneous MRI, NEARS, and EEG, and then NEARS and MEG. Uh, for the uh, the NEARS system, we were actually back then we were using Tekken systems, so they're fiber optic based uh, systems, and we were using a 32 channel Brain Vision MR plus uh, EEG system. And so you can kind of see our layout here. Um, basically, with those nearest fiber, the fiber optic based near system, 
uh, we take we took our EEG uh, e, uh, brain vision cap. Uh, we did a um, unauthorized modification of it um, um, so that we could put the the grommets to hold our fiber optics in between all the electrodes. Um, it's a little bit challenging uh, because obviously the NEARS really wants to be three centimeter source detector spacing and, and so on. Uh, and with kind of the fixed positions of the EEG, it oftentimes uh, times we'd have to kind of compromise a little bit. Sometimes we were a little bit less than three. Sometimes we were a little bit more than three uh, because we basically had to work around the EEG sensors. Um, in the end, we actually ended up moving some of the EEG sensors um, to better accommodate the NEARS in there. Um, so it's not quite the standard montage. Um, doing the experiment together, uh, it's not quite the standard montage for EEG. Um, and then it's not quite the, a standard montage for, for NEARS either. It's kind of a compromise um, so that we could, we could fit all the fiber optics in and keep that source detector spacing. Um, but you kind of see it here that we have the grommets, that we, 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 we put the grommets and then our fiber optics fit into those, those, those grommets in between. Um, uh, from a practical note, um, what we end up doing when we set up the experiment is we go in, we set up the nears first. So we make sure that all the fiber optics are touching the head, that we're getting good signal to noise. Um, that if we have to move the nears cap, we do so before we glue the electrodes down, or uh, the EEG down. And so we make sure that the nears is good. Then we go back in and um, uh, we fill in the electrodes with the conducting gel. We optimize the impedances for the EEG. And then we return once more to the nears just to make sure nothing uh, changed. Uh, but at that point, because the electrodes have already been glued in place, if we had a bad, uh, if say we accidentally moved one of the near sensors and we no longer have good signal to noise, uh, it's really hard to fix it without disrupting the EEG. So you kind of have to balance um, uh, uh, having good data for, for both, which is why we ended up losing, again, um, four out of our 15 subjects. Um, and I already kind of explained that the task in both cases, the subjects are kind of laying in or sitting um, in the room. Uh, in MEG, it's a shielded room. So like uh, fMRI, the fiber optics go through the wall. There's a, there's a pass through in the wall. And then you can kind of see going up into the cap. Um, while you can do EEG with uh, MEG, uh, so we could have done a, a triple ex uh, modality experiment in that part too. Um, uh, the challenge with MEG is fitting the fiber optics, the nearest fiber optics into the cap. Um, as I said, we already lose a number of subjects because they don't fit with the nears. And so adding, we chose not to add that a complexity of EEG in addition to that. So we only did the EEG with the fMRI. Um, so here's the, end, the results. This is the localizer task. And what we're looking at here is the um, area of brain activity that was um, uh, activated uh, during the localizer task for each of these different modalities. So we see the fMRI, the NEARS, the uh, MEG uh, ERP, and then the EEG ERP responses. Uh, and we see very good agreement in terms of all four of these modalities uh, localizing the activity to the left somatosensory cortex. Um, and you see down here, this is the, was the layout of our, our nearest probe uh, for this experiment. It's just a unilateral probe. Um, why we did a unilateral probe was because, again, with all these different modalities, having to put twice as many fiber optics would have taken a lot longer, would have been a lot more complex. And in the case of the MEG, uh, we actually learned that it was really hard to fit people uh, in the MEG scanner with bilateral uh, uh, NEARS. Um, this is a close-up of, uh, of this, and you see kind of here's the primary somatosensory cortex uh, in, in all of these subjects, and you see very nice agreement uh, in the, the location of the fMRI and the MEG, uh, the NEARS deoxy and oxyhemoglobin, and also the EEG. Uh, in this case, actually, EEG actually has kind of the lowest uh, spatial resolution of, of, of the modalities um, 
in this uh, in this in this data set. Um, if we look a little bit more in carefully at this, um, while they they do spatially agree, um, there are discrepancies in terms of where in the brain how deep that brain activity was occurring uh, or kind of uh, coming from. So the nears. Um, largely is is more superficial than the MEG or the EEG. Um, the MEG and EEG likewise is more superficial than the fMRI um, because all all of those modalities right are, are just like near seeing it from the surface and so the image reconstruction gets pulled to the surface a little bit. And so we did have kind of systematic biases in the center of location, the center of mass of these different modalities um, and, and, and so on. Um, what we actually do to make these pretty pictures is uh, quite an involved uh, uh, pipeline of data analysis. So we end up actually taking the MRI data from each subject, we segment it into a layered model of the head, so skin, skull, CSF, brain. Uh, we then we use FreeSurfer, the MRI program, to do that. So we generate segmented heads. And then we can use those segment, the same segmented head to drive the EEG or the MEG Ford model, the, the, um, the MEG EEG equivalent of the banana function. Where did the sensors measure from? We can use that same segmented head to drive the nearest Ford model. And then we can use uh, methods that I'll describe in, in a second to basically use that anatomical MRI to do inverse models, to reconstruct NEARS data, to reconstruct EEG or MEG data, so, so that we can make all of our data then in the exact same space, so that we can make those images to compare the different modalities to uh, each other. And as you see, you see, when we do that, we get a very nice agreement. So this is really uh, showing that NEARS and EEG and fMRI and, and MEG all are really kind of seeing the same underlying brain activity, uh, uh, the, the same uh, spatial location for that. That was the localizer task. As I said, we also did this pulsed pair experiment. And so in the pulsed pair experiment, as, as mentioned, it goes back to a 2000 uh, paper by Seji Agawa that did this in, in rodents. Um, and so the idea was by changing the interval between these two stimuli, uh, you ended up getting a response that looked like this, um, um, where if, um, and then they actually did the experiment again in human visual cortex with a visual experiment. Uh, but what you end up seeing is that when the, the inner stimulus interval is really short, what ends up happening is the first response comes, but then the neurons can't respond fast enough, and so you don't get an S2 peak. And so if you look at the ratio of S1 to S2, what happens is when it's below a certain threshold, you don't get an S2 peak. And if you look at kind of the integrated area as you go uh, into that refractory zo zone, the integrated area drops down once the uh, two events become separated enough, now you start to get that S2 peak again and the integrated area increases. Um, and so what we did was we took our NEARS data and um, looked at then the ERP responses to these uh, as a function of interstimulus interval. And so uh, here's the really short ones. You really see kind of only one response. Um, you've got these periods of neural refractory where the second response is almost completely missing. Um, but then as it goes up to 300 seconds and beyond, now you start getting two responses again. You get two independent responses. And so if you look at that, that integrated area, it looks very similar to the plot that um, Seiji Agawa showed. Um, if you look at the, the peak amplitude, uh, again, kind of, we see this this sort of dip, this U-shaped behavior that very much matches uh, what Seiji Agawa showed uh, in in the rodent model. So that was the the ERPs, but we can show the same thing with the nears then. Um, and so in the green and the red, uh, the green is the fMRI result, the red is the nears result. We see a similar kind of dip in a U-shaped behavior in the hemodynamic responses as what we saw in the neural responses. And so kind of uh, 
replicating that result from, from Seji Agawa. Now, one thing to keep in mind, this data from, from rodents, right, is several thousand events. You take, you know, a dozen rodents and stimulate them for several hours to get nice responses. When we deal with human data, our sample size and number of trials is a lot smaller. Um, and so our data is a little bit, quite a bit, quite a bit noisier than uh, what was in the Agawa paper. Um, but a similar trend in terms of this, this uh, U-shaped behavior. In a um, number of those subjects, towards the end of the experiment, um, um, I think it ended up to be about the last five subjects or so, uh, we had confidence enough in our methods that we actually started to do um, a bilateral probe. So we ended up taking our NEARS and expanding it uh, quite a bit to get a bilateral um, uh, somatosensory response. Uh, so we've got probes on both sides of the head and a little bit in the frontal there. And doing those same recordings with the NEARS uh, uh, MEG and the NEARS EEG fMRI, um, what we can start to do in that case is now actually we started to look at uh, resting state connectivity uh, between those modalities. Um, and so this is, uh, um, we, we're still in the process of looking at this, this data, of analyzing this data. So this is a, this is a small sample size. Um, but here, what we're doing is we're doing a seed region on the nears. So if we seed the uh, right somatosensory cortex, we end up finding connections to the left somatosensory cortex a little bit to the, kind of the premotor type areas. Um, very similar responses if we take that same seed region uh, to the MEG um, that we get. And if the, we then go and extract the time courses from this, what we can do is we can overlay the NEARS with um, the MEG after what we do is we take the neural signal, the, the MEG in this case, or the EEG, we convolve it with an HRF so that it looks like um, basically predicting what a hemodynamic response would look like. This was the neural activity and I convolve it with an HRF. This is the what I would expect the hemodynamic activity to look like. And so then if we do that, we see um, quite nice agreement between the MEG and the NEARS in these co-localized regions of interest. Uh, if we do the same thing with the NEARS and the fMRI, um, we get a, a, a bit better agreement even um, between those two modalities. So what that experiment uh, really is showing is really one way that you can start to use multimodal data, which is to try to validate. You know, I have a new method for NEARS resting state, and I want to see how it compares. So if I if I go and I, I compare this to fMRI, or in this case, uh, MEG EEG, uh, we can start to see whether or not uh, our analysis methods and our measurements are agreeing, or is there some sort of systematic bias in the results? In the case of the image reconstruction, there was a systematic bias. The NEARS was a lot more superficial than the, the, the MEG and the EEG, and all of that was a lot more superficial than the fMRI. And so we can start to understand those biases, understand those limitations when we do these kind of multimodal experiments. Um, just another example of a cross-validation uh, study. So uh, one of my other students, um, Helmut Karim, uh, was interested in studying vestibular function. So this is a near study uh, that he did, uh, he published back in 2013. Um, and what, what Helmut was interested in doing was studying how the brain coordinates posture. So we were using this vestibular task called a equitest, a sensory organization test. And basically what you do is you stand on this platform and it alternates between these four conditions. So you have SOT1, which is a fixed platform. So it's stable under your feet, your eyes are open. And then if I have the person close their eyes, which is SOT2, uh, what happens is now um, you were previously using vision to help you uh, uh, guide your balance. And so when you remove that vision, now you're forced to use more information from your inner ear. You're forced to use information from what's called proprioception, which is your kind of knowledge that my feet are downwards and my ankles are right, ang are right angles to the, the ground. 
um, we can then take that person with their eyes closed and suddenly have the platform start sway referencing. So now when I lean forward, the platform leans with me. So now what happens is now I've removed that information I was getting from my angles. And so we can, we can look at um, uh, how the brain integrates and changes, adapts to the loss or addition to information in this balance type task. And Helmut went on, he published a number of papers, both in uh, healthy adults and then people with vestibular problems, people with aging, um, uh, various, uh, um, uh, various populations looking at brain activity. This was actually his, just the first one in uh, healthy subjects. Uh, so here I am standing in that, and look, I had hair back then. Um, and, and what you end up seeing is you see uh, primarily the area of um, left uh, temporal parietal junction, left um, uh, superior temporal uh, gyrus uh, is strongly involved with this kind of multi-sensory integration. And this was the area that Helmut found was to be activated with this. That was all just NEARS. But one of the, throughout all of those studies, and we published maybe a half dozen papers on this kind of balance task, one of the kind of mysteries that we found echoed in all of that data was that the hemodynamic response was a lot um, more late, um, longer than we expected it to be. So here you see this is um, standing, then we take the platform away and we see this increase in brain activity. Um, but then we return the platform back to, to stationary and the hemodynamic response takes quite a long time to recover. Now you say, okay, hemodynamic response is slow, but it's not this slow. Typically when you do an experiment, tap your fingers, cognitive task, whatever, the brain response typically takes about 10, maybe 15 seconds to recover back to baseline, right? Here we're seeing it, this is um, uh, 80 seconds. So this is almost uh, 30 seconds after the task is returned back to baseline, uh, the brain activity is still elevated. And actually, there was another paper that we did when we did uh, what's called caloric um, test, which is a direct stimulation of the ear. You basically put um, hot or cold water on the eardrum, and this stimulates a feeling of dizziness, where the response basically lasted 90 seconds after the task was over. And so this had always just really confused us. Why was the brain taking this long to recover? Was this an artifact? Was this some sort of systemic response, physiological response that, that um, we were just seeing, heart rate elevated, something like that? Or was this something actually truly in the brain that was taking this long to, to, to recover? And so what we ended up wanting to do was using NEAR's EEG in this context to try to understand what was going on in the brain. What was driving this really latent hemodynamic response? Um, was it something in the neural uh, circuitry or was it just a kind of an artifact of the hemodynamic response itself? So, so why, uh, so, 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 so really trying to understand the neuro origins of that signal. Hi, Ashley, hi Dr. Yes. Robert, sorry for the interruption. Um, we just had a request to remove the doc on the bottom. If you select. Oh. Command option D, we're just missing some slides. Command um, D. Uh, command option D, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, it's still there. Um, oh, now it's gone, right? I think. Uh, you, now still you're see it. you still see it. I don't see it. Uh, okay, now it's gone. Now it's gone. Now okay. it's gone. You're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yep, no problem. No, you guys didn't want to see all the programs that I'm, I'm currently running on my computer. So, okay, um, sorry, we're, so, so anyway, so we wanted to do NEARS EEG to really understand um, and, and validate that what we were measuring with the NEARS was actually related to the neural activity. And, and so, so again, kind of, if we use the same idea, um, uh, this is actually the, the picture I showed before it was actually from this, this, uh, this study, but it's uh, exact same layout we had our, uh, 32 channel brain vision system, we integrated, we interweaved uh, the NEARS fiber optics between there. So we're covering 
kind of left and right um, superior temporal gyrus. Uh, we've got a little bit of fiber optics on the back covering vestibular or visual cortex. Um, we unfortunately did not have the fancy brain vision move system. Uh, so we're, we're using a tethered um, kind of the, the same um, uh, amps that we use for the MRI, where we basically set the, the amps next to the subject um, and had, then had the ribbon cable up to the, 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 the head cap uh, for the EEG. So we're able to then stand and do NIRS EEG simultaneously in this, this, this experiment. And so what we ended up finding was um, that it actually was uh, an elongated response in the neural activity, particularly, particularly in the alpha power. So when you did this experiment and you went from one condition, let's say eyes open with a fixed platform to eyes, uh, eyes open with a fixed platform to eyes open on a sway reference platform, what ended up happening was you got a, a huge increase in alpha power, particularly in this um, uh, temporal parietal junction, which then if you go and you looked at the nearest signal, that's exactly where we saw the increase in the nearest signal as, as, as well. Um, and so very much an overlap in the spatial locations of this increased alpha power um, uh, with the nears, but also uh, correlation in the time course that this alpha power increase lasted a lot longer than you would have expected with a typical um, uh, standard brain uh, activity, brain task. And what we actually think is going on now that we're designing the experiments to test is basically that what happens when you do this kind of task is you're standing on a fixed platform, uh, you're, you, you remove that fixed platform, your brain needs to adjust immediately or you would have fallen over. So the loss of sensory information needs to be immediate. Your brain needs to respond immediately uh, or risk falling over. But when we go back, when we introduce that information back in, your brain was doing okay. You were balancing just fine without that bit of information. I add that, that sensory information back in and the idea is that your, your, your body, your brain, goes through a period of basically probing the environment. Um, we know from the posture literature that what you do is you actually send out postural adjustments, body sway. You're not even aware of doing it as a way of checking whether or not all those channels of information are consistent with each other. This new bit of information from perception that was just added back in, do I trust it? And so your body sends out these, these probes to see whether or not that's, that's a trusted bit of information before it more slowly integrates it back into the system. And that's kind of based, that hypothesis is based on the uh, posturography literature, uh, people that just study balance that don't measure brain activity at all. And so we're excited to see that uh, we might actually be able to detect sort of those events in the brain with these simultaneous nearest EEG type experiments. Um, and and so, so something that's, that's very exciting to us uh, moving ahead. So just another example of using nearest EEG to try to understand what's going on and validate whether or not what we measured from the nearest was actually um, uh, reasonable. So, um, Another thing you can do with uh, simultaneous measurements is you can start to actually integrate them with models of what that physiology is. I know from you know hundreds of papers out there of what the biochemical basis of neurons firing and how this probably relates to vascular and drives metabolism and, and so on. And so you can take all of those those physiological principles, and you can start to develop models that help you take NIRS EEG data and try to invert it to estimate underlying uh, physiological processes within the brain. Um, and so, uh, for better or worse, those physiological processes are very, very complex in terms of what's going on in the brain, right? When your neurons fire, they, of course, drive metabolism that metabolism can be either non-oxidative, that is, it's not using oxygen, or oxidative glycolysis. Most of neural activity is oxidative, uh, but you do, have, you do have both. 
You also have neurons that uh, act directly on blood vessels to cause dilation. The arterial response, the blood flow increases. Uh, this is your typical hyperemic response that we see with the nears where blood volume and oxygenation increases because those neurons talking to the blood vessels actually end up dilating and causing a blood flow response uh, that actually oversupplies oxygen to that, that region. So the, generally the flow response is about two to three times bigger than the metabolism response. These two events, the, the supply of oxygen and the demand for oxygen, uh, both have competing effects on changes in oxygenation. So what we measure for oxy and deoxyhemoglobin is this competition between supply and the increase of blood flow supplying fresh arterial blood and the demand for oxygen uh, through the oxidative part of the metabolism. And of course, um, you know, there's all sorts of feedback loops in here. It turns out uh, oxygen is vasoconstrictive, that as your blood volume changes, this puts pressure back that slows arterial dilation and, and so on. And so it's, it's a very complicated system if you try to map out everything, uh, just even at this gross level of the, these events. And once you start actually, um, and, and then you can put in things like how systemic physiology and vascular tone and uh, individual variations in things like blood vessel stiffness and so on ends up affecting models like this. And ultimately, we're interested in these underlying things because we can start to think about how disease affects this, right, in terms of diseases affecting neural activity or affecting metabolism or affecting uh, systemic physiology blood vessel like arterial sclerosis or something that's changing the stiffness of blood vessels and where those various disease models fit in this overall big picture it suddenly becomes a very, very complicated slide, right? And then I try to throw in imaging modalities onto this, right? And the idea that no one imaging modality can actually see the complete picture. So you can measure metabolism with things like MR spectroscopy or PET, you can measure vascular signals with NEARS or fMRI or, or um, ASL. Um, you've got the neural activity, uh, EEG, MEG. You've got invasive uh, methods that can see a little bit more in, in detail of these, these events, but nothing can see all of it. And so the idea is to start putting together models of how these various subsystems in the brain work. Um, so obviously this is this is a crazy math here, uh, but this is th my PhD thesis was actually modeling uh, these events in the brain. Um, for example, modeling blood vessels and then vascular response as a series of pipes that uh, compliant pipes that are allowed to expand to increase blood flow and blood volume and how this ends up affecting oxygen transport. And so writing all these differential equations for blood vessel responses differential equations for metabolism and how that's affected by um, uh, uh, cerebral oxygen metabolism to drive these changes in oxygenation in these various compartments. And then finally, how we can take that data, those underlying models, and relate them to our actual measurements or observations. And so um, one of the things I did in my PhD thesis was um, taking these models, developing models like this, and applying them to animal imaging data, uh, where we can actually go in and actually see the blood vessels. We can do thousands of trials, so we can get really high quality data. And what that allows you to do is actually start to, to build those models, to test those differential equations. Did they agree with actual data, and if not, find ways of tweaking them, building better models that predicts uh, the data or different features of the data. Um, and so, so actually in my PhD, we did a number of uh, studies looking at animal data where we would do optical imaging on animals to look at these models of the vascular responses. Um, those models are all published. There's a lot of differential equations. I'm not going to go through it. But the idea is you can take NEARS data or optical data uh, from animals like this, and you can start to fit the data to models uh, that try to predict the relationship between all these different parameters, all these different observations. And if you fit those models, 
the parameters of those models are things like that arterial dilation function and that oxygen metabolism function that you can actually start to infer um, from these multimodal data. And so in this study, what we did was we had, um, it was a whisker flick experiment in, in rodents. We did nine different amplitudes. And so the idea was, well, you only have one set of blood vessels. So some of these structural parameters are common to all nine conditions, but other features like the arterial dilation and the metabolism response uh, varies. And so what we did was we estimated this kind of common model parameters and then the under the states associated with each of the conditions um, to look at their responses as, as a function of stimulus condition. Um, we then actually took it a step further, and um, in this study, we did hypercapnia. It's a CO2 inhalation, and so what that does is that changes the vascular tone, so it ends up changing parameters related to those structural, um, those baseline parameters, but in known ways, so it's going to change the baseline uh, total hemoglobin is going to change the transit time. And so then you can go and you can show that you you can fit that data as well by only allowing these these uh, these structural parameters uh, to change. And so you can go and, and look at that and show that, um, yeah, when you did uh, the CO2 challenge, for example, metabolism was exactly the same between normal capnia and hypercapnia. Uh, that the only difference was this underlying change in tweaking that one baseline parameter that that um, that changed the shape of the responses, um, but still allowed you to fit the data. So you can take all of this data then, put it into these giant models to estimate these model parameters from that. And what you can do from that, from the animal data, is you can build better and better models to understand how uh, metabolism and blood flow relate to these uh, these observable hemodynamic parameters. The animal data, the high quality of the animal data lets you uh, fit those parameters, but then what you can do is you can then take those concepts and scale them down to work for human data, where you, you have more trouble estimating the parameters, but you already know what they should be uh, from the animal data. Oops, this is... Um, um, so in this study, we also did um, uh, uh, LFP and MUA uh, measurements. So we did electrical recordings and basically showed that the vascular and the hemo the vascular and the metabolic responses in the rodents very much correlated with the underlying neural uh, signals that we were measuring. Um, but it allowed us to build these very complicated models of the hemodynamic response, uh, but then go and take our actual NEARS data, so in this case it was NEARS fMRI ASL, and start to fit that data to estimate the underlying metabolism and blood flow responses uh, in the brain from, from humans. Um, and so we can do that same sort of trick that we did in the animals, uh, estimating these, these, these underlying models um, and underlying uh, responses from uh, human data. And so, so, and, and um, so we can do that. This was taking regions of interest and fitting them to to these these the time courses to these models. We've since been able to go and do image reconstruction with these nonlinear models to reconstruct images of oxygen metabolism and blood flow from uh, these kind of multimodal data. And then we can go into um, sorry, I'm forgetting what slides I actually have. Uh, we can go into um, that case of neural, uh, of EEG NEARS and MEG NEARS and, and so on, and actually start to understand the neurovascular, and not necessarily the, the neural hemodynamic, but how the neural activity relates to the metabolism and relates to the blood flow responses, uh, because we knew in the animal model that that was what was most uh, related. Um, so. Um, so that's physiological models. And all of that is actually coded up in the toolbox, and I'm going to show that um, in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, um, but let me just uh, end really quickly with my PowerPoint talking about methods that we can use for statistically fusing data together. So this is methods that are based on the fact that NEARS and EEG measure something similar. 
uh, we know that from that first, that cross-validation, that we expect the locations to be uh, spatially in about the same spot. And so what that means is we can actually start to use statistical methods. We don't have to know exactly what that biological relationship between the nearest EEG is. We just know it have to know that it's more statistically likely to have NIRS and EEG in the same space, um, and we can then use that to, to guide our, our, um, our inferences. Um, so let me start before I, I do the NIRS EEG to kind of show what we've done in the past with NIRS fMRI, because it's a lot easier. Because in that case, we can actually write down models of what the bold signal measures and what the nearest signal uh, measures. And so we know the nearest signal, for example, is this projection of underlying changes in the volume of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So we have on the left-hand side, we have our source detector measurements. On the right-hand side, we have the, the sensitivity, the banana matrix. And then we have our unknowns, the volume space changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin that we're trying to estimate. So we know that this this is an inverse problem that we have far more unknowns that we do measurements uh, to invert these bananas to make pretty pictures um, uh, without prior knowledge is 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 in pot mathematically impossible, and so we have to introduce some sort of regularization, some sort of priors in order to to guide that problem. Likewise, with fMRI, we have a similar problem that it's it's it doesn't have an inverse model. That is, the fMRI the spatially maps the deoxyhemoglobin signals, but we do have an issue with calibration, that the fMRI percent signal change is somehow proportional to deoxyhemoglobin, but we just don't know what that proportionality constant is. And so, so what we did uh, in the past was we were able to write down these joint observation models uh, where we can explicitly write down what that observation model is. This is what the NIRS measured. This is what the fMRI measured. They have this common set of unknowns. And we can then invert that to make joint images. So we can make, um, on the left here, the image of reconstruction of the fMRI. On the right side, the reconstruction using both NIRS and fMRI. And so um, in, in doing that, we can actually use the NIRS to calibrate the fMRI uh, signal and, and get something that's spatially consistent with the fMRI, but the amplitude is consistent with the oxy and deoxyhemoglobins and the time course that we get from, from the NIRS. So the way that we actually do this to, to, to um, kind of set me up to talk about NIRS EEG reconstruction is, we have this joint observation model, and we do a Bayesian reconstruction. Uh, that is, we have to introduce uh, these ideas of uh, noise and the fact that each modality kind of has slightly different noise fr from each other. We also have this idea that the underlying state, the underlying parameters themselves, have some uncertainty to it. And so this is the this is the Gauss-Markov equation or the kind of the cost function of the Gauss-Markov equation, uh, which basically says you're trying to fit the data. So you're trying to find the beta, the parameters that predicted the, the data, um, but are also constrained by the fact that you don't want parameters that are too big and you don't want them to, to be um, uh, uh, too, too different from each other. And so you have this, this type two, um, uh, regular, this L2 regularization term in here. And so, so what we can do is we can use methods like um, uh, uh, restricted maximum likelihood, where you go in, what restricted maximum likelihood does, REML, is it tries to estimate that model um, iteratively in a way that estimates both the parameters and the noise parameters themselves. The, the, it estimates both beta and the noise terms CN and CP. And so the way that that actually works in, in REML is you start off with a estimate of what the noise is. So you guess what the noise is, you reconstruct your data, uh, you reconstruct your betas, and then now you have an a image, uh, an initial est estimate of the image. You then take that, oops, you take that estimate of the image, oops, I'm missing slides here, that's all right. You take that estimate of the image and then you update 
to find a better um, estimate of the noise. So, so you take beta now as truth, you go back and you estimate what the CNNCP terms were. You now have a better estimate of those noise, of those CNNCP terms. You go back and you estimate new betas and you keep iterating. And this is what's called expectation maximization. And you, you go through and you, est you iterate through until you get a nice convergent answer where you've estimated both the image, beta, and its uncertainty properties. And in doing this, what's, what's, um, what's nice about REML is you can, what you do is instead of estimating the entire covariance, you parameterize it in some way. So we know that the noise for the nears has a, um, uh, is different between the two wavelengths. So we have a, in this case, it was an 830 and a 690 measurement, but they have different noise to, to each other. Likewise, with oxy and deoxy, we have a parameter that applies to estimate the oxy uh, uncertainty and a parameter that estimates the deoxy uncertainty. And maybe we have one that estimates the cross terms. The fact that oxy goes up and deoxy goes down means that we expect a negative off diagonal in this, this position here. And so maybe that's another term in the model. And so what you do in restricted maximum likelihood is instead of estimating the entire covariance matrix, you parameterize it uh, imposing some structure um, and then estimate those lambda terms, those hyperparameters, uh, when you do this EM estimation. And what's, no, I'm just going to skip that. What's, what's nice about this restricted maximum likelihood is you can use this concept to introduce various types of covariance priors that code things that you know about your nears. So, for example, oxy and deoxy are anti-correlated with each other. So I expect statistically where I have the deoxyhemoglobin or where I have the oxyhemoglobin image, I expect to have a negative deoxy in roughly the same spot. Um, so it's a statistical prior that they're gonna be in similar locations but go opposite directions. And so you can, you can do that by introducing a, a negative term in the off diagonal here uh, encoding that space of the covariance between oxy and, and negative deoxy. And so we can introduce all sorts of different hyperparameters, all, all sorts of different multiple priors into our model um, um, that allow us to statistically combine things like the fact that oxy goes up and deoxy goes down. Um, this is just an example. Um, this was from the paper where we published it, where we can show that um, uh, here's the truth image. If we do a reconstruction, we get a nice um, reconstructed area in, in the right location for, for oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. Um, if we go to a more complicated problem, so this is a two-layered model where we have a skin layer and a brain layer, what we can do is we can regularize, we can put one set of parameters for the skin layer and a second set of parameters for the, the brain layer, and we can estimate them um, at the same time. So we now have a differential regularization to the top layer and the bottom layer. And when we do that, we see we get a nice um, uh, reconstruction that goes down to the brain um, and avoids uh, the, the, the skin. And so where does this come in? So we've done this before for NEARS. All of our image reconstruction right now for NEARS is based on this idea of restricted maximum likelihood estimates. But what we can do is we can actually use that as a way of doing joint analysis for multiple modalities. And so just like we did with the NEARS fMRI, where we wrote down a simultaneous Ford operator, um, we can also write down a, a simultaneous forward operator for NEARS EEG experiments. So in this case, we have our NEARS measurements here. We have 690, 830, so the source detector channels from the NEARS. But we then also have our electrode-based uh, EEG measurements. Excuse me. Um, we have a forward operator here that contains the NEARS part that projects oxy and deoxyhemoglobin to project the NEARS. We have a second part that predicts the, the EEG projecting out, in, in this case, we're estimating directly the alpha power uh, for the EEG, but it's the EEG Ford model. Now, there's no off diagonals in the observation model. There's nothing to impose 
uh, basically we could take this and split it back up into an EEG only reconstruction and NIRS only reconstruction um, because there's no off diagonals, they're completely independent at this point. But what we can do then is in that Rummel framework, we can introduce statistical priors. So we can say that um, up here in the upper corner here, we've got an oxy variance term, we've got a deoxy variance term, we've got a negative term on the diagonal that says oxy is going to go up and deoxy is going, going to go down. Likewise, we have a, a EEG variance term. But now we also have these terms on in the, 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 the last row here that link together oxyhemoglobin and EEG. So we have this, this term here that says that oxyhemoglobin is more likely to spatially occur in the same spot of EEG alpha activity. And deoxy, oops, and oops, and deoxy is more likely to negative, have a negative uh, amplitude in the same area that we have the EEG alpha power. And so the idea is that we actually, um, it's a statistical prior and we're taking our data and in a data-driven way, estimating what these lambdas are. Um, uh, in, this, in this paper, um, I guess I don't have the citation, but what we actually showed is that if you have bad priors, so you say it's in a region of interest that it actually isn't, that what the model ends up doing is it takes that lambda term uh, and sets it to zero. And so it's the same thing as not having it there in the first place. If that information was not useful in solving the model, the model learns to ignore it. And so what we can do is we can put in this, I believe there to be this relationship between oxy, hemoglobin, and EEG power, and let the model, the data-driven approach, determine how important that, uh, that prior is, what that hyperparameter lambda is. And so if that, that relationship is wrong, it's basically gonna come, it's gonna look like EEG and near is completely separate analysis. But if that prior has information that helps guide the model that's consistent with the data, now what it's gonna do is it's gonna start to rely on it more. And so, so we can use that framework then to start to do uh, joint image reconstruction using this statistical prior that we believe them to, to kind of occur in the same spot. And so if we look at the first row here, the first column here, this is the EEG uh, reconstruction. We get kind of this um, roughly the same spot as the NEARS, so an EEG only, NEARS only. We get the same, the same spatial location, but we, oops, but we have a uh, much larger point spread function. The EEG signal is a lot blurrier. It's a, it's a lot sp lower spatial resolution. Um, just like NEARS, it's an ill-posed problem. There was multiple solutions that of the image reconstruction that gave you that EEG data, right? And just, just like there was for NEARS. But when we do the reconstruction together, now we get the same location, but the EEG has been much more spatially constrained. Of those uh, infinite solutions for the EEG, a smaller subset were also consistent with the NEARS. And so, so, so what we end up doing is by introducing the NEARS here uh, and saying that it's statistically more likely that the EEG occurred where the NEARS did, it picks out those solutions that were more consistent with both. Both of these solutions, uh, the, the, for the EEG, the one on the left and the one on the right, are both completely consistent with the data. They would have, if you project them out to sensor space, would have given you the same sensor space representation. But this one, the one on the right, is also more consistent with the, e, the NEARS data. And so that, when you do the multimodal reconstruction, that's the one that gets more favored. And so we can actually use this to improve um, uh, our, our, our EEG reconstruction. Um, and as a note, actually, we end up increasing the effect size in this case by almost 50%. Um, this is simulated data, but, but um, the T-score the goes up by almost about, by about 50%, uh, which means that you need much less uh, subjects to get that, to obtain that same power. 
Um, so, so it's actually a, a really big um, a fact. And then finally, I'll just 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 end here. Uh, one of the things we can also do with this kind of uh, methodology, this was some work we did for for uh, this was a DARPA project developing a um, kind of a custom MEG system. And what we are, we're we're showing is that if we have mirrors there, what we can do is is um, like I showed in the last plot, using less subjects, we can obtain the same power with with fewer subjects. We can also obtain the same spatial resolution using fewer sensors. And, and so this is the, the plot on the bottom right here is looking at the error in um, between a, um, a simulated activity and a reconstructed activity as a function of the number of sensors you needed to obtain that. And so when we use kind of this multimodal fusion, we can get away with far fewer sensors um uh to to get the same spatial resolution um and so this was important in this darpa project because these sensors were like i don't know twenty thousand dollars a piece or something and so we wanted to figure out what was the minimum number we needed to obtain a certain uh spatial resolution um and we could we could get away with uh far fewer um using uh this multimodal approach by adding the nears in there so that's that's the end of my talk. I just wanted to introduce some of these these concepts. Um, Ashlyn, how am I? Am I okay to go for another ten minutes, or? Um, yes, please. Or do you um, want to I do, think there are a lot of questions at this point. Uh, and I think we're good to move on to the to the next. Okay. Because yeah, I you. wanted to, if I can figure out how to switch my screen again. So how do I bring back my? Now that I, I lost my, uh, oh, there it is. Oh. Okay. I couldn't find my uh, my little panel at the bottom. <laughs> we, hit, we hit it on you. We hit it on yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so um, all right. So I, I wanted to show um, show some of this in the, the nearest toolbox. And so the, the nearest toolbox, right, so, so um, if you download the nearest toolbox, you've probably, and you've played around with it, you've probably played around with all of the nearest parts of it. So all of your commands look like something like, you know, nears.testing.simdata or something like that. But we also have in the nearest toolbox, we've been coding up a very similar uh, parallel pipeline for dealing with EEG and MEG. Um, and also this, uh, what's called the DT series, the dense time series, which is an fMRI thing. Um, and so you have these, if you look in the root folder of nearest toolbox, should I, uh, can we see this or maybe I'll make my font a little bit bigger. We can see pretty well. You can see it. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, so in addition to the dot nears or the plus nears, we also have a plus EEG, which I'm going to show. And we have this plus DT series. Um, the DT series data are, it reads in what are called SIFTY files. SIFTY files are um, kind of surface based time courses and surface based information. Uh, they came out of a lot of the human connectome pipeline uh, for, for fMRI analysis. Um, and so these are kind of the brain activity, you know, the bold signal as a function of the surface of the brain. And extracting this and, and so on. So that's what this DT series folder does. But the EEG, the EEG ones, we have a series of tools. Uh, so if you type EEG dot, uh, you see actually a very similar structure to what the NIRS uh, was. You have this set of modules, you have a folder for testing, uh, what are things like simulate data. Um, you have an IO fo folder for input output. Um, so the IO folder has, we have right now the ability to read in brain vision data, we can read in EDF uh, MEG data, we can read in FIF MEG data, um, uh, open BCI uh, data. So we have, uh, I don't have nearly as many um, loaders as what I have for, for the EEG or for the NEARS rather. Uh, we're still working on a lot of these tools. Uh, in fact, as, as I started working through this talk, Last week, I realized that 
a lot of the EEG toolboxes uh, not working as well as it should, uh, so I need to fix it. Um, um, but we have the ability to load in uh, data coming from different platforms. Right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load in uh, EEG. I'm just going to use my testing, and I'm going to load in some some uh, just simulated data like this. And so, uh, so you, you could have said EEG.io.loadbrainvision or something, and it would have loaded in your data. Um, and actually, just for sake of argument, let's do well, it goes nears.testing.simdata. Um, and so, if we look at the uh, if we look at the EEG data here versus the NIRS data here, we see an almost identical structure of information. Uh, we have the data field, uh, which in this case in the NIRS was 32 channels by 3,000 time points. In the EEG case is 31 channels by 60,000 time points at 200 hertz. We have a probe, uh, just like we have a probe for the NIRS. We have stimulus. And demographic information just like we do for the nears if we do the commands like draw uh, just like the e the nears data it will draw that channel of eeg with the stimulus um, overlaid onto it if we say probe dot draw oops, uh, it'll draw the eeg layout um, um, just like it drew the nears the nears layout and so we have these very, very similar function calls between our EEG pipeline and our NIRS pipeline. Um, in the, oops, let me jump to the top of the screen there. Uh, we have a set of modules that are kind of EEG specific. So we have um, a bandpass filter uh, module. So let's just see that for a second. So if I say something like job equals eeg.bandpass, um, it creates this bandpass filter, right? And I can go and I can set, let's, let's just do a low pass at uh, 50 hertz or something. Um, so this is, gonna, this is gonna low pass filter the data at 50 hertz. And I can go and I can take that data, so if I say job.run, given that eeg data, now it's resampled that, or it's 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 filtered that EEG data down. Um, this flag here that says do downsample. Uh, once you're at 50 hertz, you're um, um, you, you don't have any information above that, and so you can actually downsample to 100 hertz, and you still you have a smaller data set, but now you have the same information. Um, so it actually uh, will take the new night. Um, It'll filter. Uh, it'll resample the data as well as as uh, low pass filter it. If you have this as false, it'll keep it at the original 200 hertz. But that that job, so the jobs can be applied to EEG data in the exact same way that it can be applied to to NIRS. In fact, actually, if I go and I take this, um, let's do two hertz, that I can actually take the same job and apply it to the NIRS data, and it runs just fine. Um, so, so, so um, a lot of the modules that we wrote for the NIRS also work for the EEG and vice versa, things like uh, filtering and, and so on. Obviously, things like Beer-Lambert law is not going to work for EEG data, uh, but a lot of those uh, jobs can actually be um, recycled for both um, uh, modalities um, and also for the fMRI uh, ones as well. So the jobs we don't have nearly a selection of EEG jobs as we have for 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 uh, NIRS, but we have a bandpass filter. Uh, we have a, a, a ERP uh, version of the GLM. We have a resting state connectivity um, that I think is actually wavelet based, um, or no? We just it's it's just. Um, uh, I'll return to that in a second. But we have a resting state connectivity for EEG. We have this function that's called HRF Convolve. That what it does is it takes the um, let's just see this uh, uh, hemodynamic is job dot run given the filtered EEG data. But what this does is this um, takes the EEG data 
and pretends like it was a hemodynamic response or um, kind of creates the hemodynamic response simulated from that data. Uh, so it takes the EEG and convolves it with an HRF uh, to get an expected hemo what the hemodynamic signal would have looked like. Um, so one approach to NIRS EEG um, correlation is you can either take your EEG data, convolve it, so it's the same time um, scale as the hemodynamic and then correlate it that way, or you can take the NIRS and you can somehow deconvolve it to estimate a, a neural driving the, uh, and then correlate it with the EEG, but somehow you have to get the hemodynamic and the EEG into the same space. And it either means downsampling the EEG or upsampling the NIRS. Um, and you can do that, the, the downsample version with this hemodynamic convolve uh, function. Uh, we have uh, our ketosis filter that basically what it does, what that EEG ketosis filter does, um, it can take a model, which is either PCA or ICA. And what it does is it takes the EEG data it does a PCA, it then looks at the components of the EEG and computes a kurtosis uh, for each of those, those principal components. It looks for statistical outliers. Component number five had a really high kurtosis compared to the rest of them. It then downweights component number five based on, based on that kurtosis value and then rotates back. And so the idea is if, uh, things like eye blank or movement are going to have really high kurtosis, it, but it might not necessarily be the first component. It might be, eye blank might be the third component or the seventh component or something like that. But we use kurtosis to then figure out which component it is, uh, remove it, and then filter it back. Um, you can do that using either PCA for your base rotation or ICA for your base rotation. Uh, so you could have said, um, uh, job so you could have said job dot model is ICA um, and then it would have run the ICA version and this is just curious data filter two is job dot run given data uh, f2 dot draw I don't actually know what this is going to look like uh, and actually it's, it's I wish I could show it without the the blue lines here can I Delete the blue lines somehow. Um, but but you see it that the uh, the red lines here. So that's so I've removed kind of the um, uh, uh, the the downweighted components that had high kurtosis. Uh, we also have so that's kurtosis filter. We have an image reconstruction. We have a group level model. We have a um, skip that one for a second, a notch filter, um, a wavelet transform, so if we want to do uh, spectral analysis of our EEG. Um, this MRI correct one, uh, it's still a work in progress, but actually we do a lot of EEG inside the MRI where you have that huge gradient artifact from uh, the MRI scanner. And so this is kind of a novel, it's a, uh, a method for removing that MRI artifact from the EEG data. Um, um, it's something we need to publish because it actually works. It works really well um, and better than some of the even commercial uh, versions of that of that that code. Um, um, and then we have uh, some methods like multimodal image reconstruction. Uh, which you do the methods like what I just described of take NIRS data, EEG data, put them together and do a joint image reconstruction. And so, so, so we have these these tools in the e, these EEG tools in the NIRS toolbox. If you go into um, in the toolbox, if you go to demos, uh, you'll see there's a folder called EEG demos and um, as I said, as I was working through this talk, I realized some of this wasn't actually working as well as it should, um, but it goes through and simulates data, um, kind of starts to demonstrate uh, what's in the probe field, what's in, you know, it's got a link field just like the NIRS did. How do you draw things? How do you change stimulus information? How do you add demographics? 
exact same set. In fact, this is calling the nearest code to call the demographics table. Uh, and then how do you set up basic pipelines that uh, remove eye blanks and then do some sort of spatial filtering, do some sort of bandpass filtering, uh, do wavelet analysis. Um, um, and then how do you do things like estimate ERPs, image reconstruction, stuff like that. Um, and so very, you can construct very, very similar pipelines in my EEG tool set as you do with the NEARS. We also have oops, in, this in, oops, in the examples folder, examples, we have a function called examples, um, example multimodal, oops, example, multimodal and what this does is this will actually go and generate it it calls this function called sim simulate multimodal data but what it's doing is it's it's um taking a location in the brain i think the default is ba46 and it projects it out to both a nears data set and an eeg data set so consistent with some default probe geometry, this is where the EEG would have measured the activity, this is where the NEARS would have measured that activity. It then goes through and runs a NEARS pipeline, runs an EEG pipeline, so you have these channel-based EEG stats and channel-based NEARS stats. It then goes and will do a joint image reconstruction. And so to do an image reconstruction in my toolbox, um, you can either read in a custom head uh, that's been segmented, or you can read in, in this case, it's reading in the Colin 27 Atlas. Once you have that head model, um, we have EEG.forward, and that contains all of my forward modeling code for EEG. And so we can go and we can run the field trip uh, forward model that calculates the EEG sensitivity. So if I give it uh, what forward model I want to run, what brain mesh I want to use, what probe I, how, so, so what did my brain space look like? What did my sensor space look like in terms of where were the electrodes? You give it properties, the EEG dielectric properties for, for those different tissue types. You can then, uh, once you've constructed that forward operator, if you run the dot Jacobian command, what it'll do is it'll actually estimate that sensitivity profile for that probe based on that head. Um, likewise, we have very similar set of commands for the e, for the NEARS. NEARS.forward, and we have in that a number of different forward model solvers. We have um, some finite element modelings. We have some um, boundary element modeling code, uh, both from NEARFAST. We have some Monte Carlo code from Jin Jin Feng's uh, lab at, at uh, um, Northeastern University uh, that do um, uh, mesh-based Monte Carlo or GPU-based Monte Carlo. Um, so you can create, you can pick from a number of different NEARS Ford models. Once you have the Ford model uh, loaded, you tell it, did I want CW or frequency domain? what brain mesh do you want to use to, to, to guide that reconstruction? What were your optical properties here? So I'm going to use the optical properties for the brain uh, in terms of its mu A and mu S absorption scattering values. And then what was my nearest probe? How did I measure the data? And then if you run this again, same as we did here, eeg.jacobian, if you run nearest.jacobian, it'll compute those optical uh, sensitivity profiles. And here we're running specifically the Jacobian with spectral priors, which means that we want to reconstruct oxy and deoxy rather than 690 and 830 UA values. But once we have those two Jacobians, one EEG and one NEARS, now what we can do is we can run a forward model or an uh, image reconstruction model. So if we run and we, we, we create this job for the image reconstruction, we tell it the formula, we tell it the, um, uh, the brain mesh that we want to use. We can give it a basis set. So there's a, a couple of basis sets, nears dot, um, for dot, oops, nears dot, inverse dot basis. 
we have a um, identity operator. We have a Gaussian smoothing kernel. So the Gaussian smoothing kernel, we give it the mesh and the resolution, so say a two centimeter uh, smoothing kernel. Um, we also have a, uh, a wavelet smoothing um, operator that, that we've published on before. But you give it one of those um, one of those basis sets. So in this case, we're doing um, a Gaussian smoothing at a two centimeter um, um, a two centimeter smoothing kernel. And then what we do is for the Jacobian on the probe, we give it here's my EEG pro or my EEG Ford solution. Here's my nearest Ford solution. Here's my EEG probe. Here's my nearest probe. You can introduce priors. In this case, it's just um, it's it's a, um, a, a mean zero prior um, in there. But then when you do the reconstructions, you say job dot run. You run that image reconstruction operator, and if you give it both nears and EEG data, it's going to reconstruct them together. If you give it nears only data, it's going to reconstruct just. It's going to use that using that exact same job. It's going to reconstruct using just the nears data and just the EEG data. And so you can say job dot run, and depending on if you give it, you know, your nears data, or your EEG data, or both, it'll actually use. It'll figure out how to run the model, and it'll actually run the image reconstruction. Um, as as I mentioned, embarrassingly, that that code uh, doesn't work. Right now, I broke it in the last couple of weeks, um, so I need to fix it. I will do so uh, hopefully over the next few days. But that, where for my PowerPoint went, uh, but that was the code that I actually used to generate those images where I showed the reconstruction of EEG alone, NEARS alone, and then NEARS EEG together. And what'll happen is in these reconstructed objects, if you say image stats.draw, it'll actually draw a NEARS image, uh, oxy, deoxy, and then an EEG image as well. Um, so my, my toolbox supports um, um, in the exact same set of commands, uh, you can run, start to run EEG analysis as, as, as well. Um, and the last thing I'll show, actually, I don't know if this example even works at all. Um, actually, this is not documented at all, so I'm going to ignore that. But we're starting to put in uh, methods for joint uh, decomposition, uh, methods um, like what's called parafact or parallel factor analysis or partial least squares, where you have, these are both tensor-based methods, where you might have a data set that is, um, let's say you have nearest data, so the nearest data is time by number of channels by number of subjects. And you have another EEG data that's number of subjects that share that exact same edge of number of subjects, but now this is number of EEG channels by number of time. And so these are both tensors. It's a space by time by subject and a subject by space by time. They share that subject edge. And so what you can do is you can actually start to do um, joint uh, decomposition that you try to find components that um, matched between the two data sets. Uh, and so it's kind of a, uh, it's a tensor-based uh, canonical correlation analysis that tries to find out common components between your NEARS and your EEG data. Um, um, and it, that, that, those all also work with the dense time series. So if you have fMRI data in that same, um, in that, uh, same brain space, uh, you can actually use the same tools to use some of the DT series um, analysis, um, which is the dense time series fMRI stuff. Um, so I think I'm going to stop because I'm way over in time uh, compared to the hour that I said I was going to take. Um, are there any questions or anything that wasn't clear that I we want to chat about? Um, yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Hubbard. That was very informative. Um, we do definitely have some questions, so it'd be great to get okay. to those now. Um, the first one is going back to the um, validation. Th um, items of the talk. So 
so according to the high correlation between FNIRS and fMRI, we are getting extra temporal information from FNIRS and good spatial resolution too. So why would you want to integrate fMRI and why would one want to integrate FNIRS and fMRI in general? Yeah, so, so um, it's a good question. Um, and despite the fact that I, I have done so much multimodal data or multimodal acquisition, uh, concurrent multimodal acquisition. I always kind of, when someone comes and asks, I want to do simultaneous NEARS fMRI or NEARS EEG, I always kind of ask the question of, is there something particular that you're gaining from doing that concurrent measure? Because doing two measurements at the same time is more than twice as challenging, and you lose a lot more subjects because one modality doesn't work and, 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 and so on. Um, so you really have to think about why you want to do those those kind of studies like that. So in the case of the nearest fMRI, um, what we've um, uh, what we've published in the past, and it was some of the data I went through, is um, um, fMRI. One of the problems with fMRI is it's uncalibrated, and so you don't know percent signal change in bold means something different. Um, um, if you've drank coffee before your scan, because it changes your baseline properties, and all of a sudden, percent signal is, is is means a different thing. And so we know that the bold signal is 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 dependent on these baseline factors that vary from day to day. And so the idea, and 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 NIRS is also um, sensitive to those baseline factors, but in different ways. And so if you start to put them both into the same model, what you can start to do is you can start to normalize out some of that. And so in that paper, and David Boas's lab has some uh, that followed up from it, what we showed was we could actually use NEARS to calibrate the bold signal. And so um, you can think if I have NEARS on one side of the head, but bold everywhere, uh, you know, if that calibration holds for the entire brain, I can calibrate with a couple of sensors, but then apply that calibration across the brain. And all of a sudden I now have a more informative bold uh, data by just adding a few near sensors to it. And and, and David uh, Boas's lab published uh, some work on that. Um, but you can also start to do, um, so, so uh, we've done that joint image reconstruction where now we reconstruct our nears, or nears fMRI and all of a sudden we have these movies that have the spatial resolution of the fMRI, but the temporal resolution of the nears, uh, because basically, whoop, am I still here? Oh, yeah, you're still, no worries, okay. the screen just I cut, on, but cut yeah, out, my ahead. screen cut out for a second. Uh, mm -hmm. But all of a sudden have the spatial resolution of the fMRI and the temporal resolution of the nears and the amplitude, the calibrated amplitude information that neither modality had. And so you can start to put information together like that. In the context of what we've been working on more recently, one of the one of the things that I am really um, uh, pushing for multimodal and kind of trying to develop methods for is this idea of um, can you use multi -informa multimodal information to increase your statistical power? So can you do with fewer subjects or fewer trials? Um, but multiple modalities at the same time by kind of utilizing that mutual information. So, so this is really important in NEARS, right? Because a lot of times in NEARS, we like to, you know, it's a nice portable technology. We can study different populations. A lot of times those populations are uh, fewer in number. So maybe it's a disease model that's rare uh, or, or something like that, that if we actually have if we can, can if we can make better use of our subjects and their sub the subjects time by collecting the data uh, with more statistical power by fusing uh, modalities together, um, then that's that's a really good thing. And so we've been thinking about this in the context of clinical nears. That one of the things that if we wanted to move nears into the clinic, you know, it, I come into a doctor's office, they put a nears cap on your head and records brain signals. Uh, you're very limited in the amount of time, right? You can't do a two hour, uh, you know, experiment of 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for, you know, two hours, because that doesn't work in a clinical setting, right? Uh, so you're very limited in the number of trials you can do. You're very limited in the time that you have with that subject, but you also, in, in the context of wanting to be diagnostic, right? The way that we do behavioral testing, like 
for example, do you have Alzheimer's, right? They might do something like mini mental or something, which is a whole barrage of different domains of cognitive tests, you know, working memory and so on and whatever it is, man, camera, woman, picture, whatever, right? It's, it's these, all these different domains of uh, cognitive assessment that you only really do one or two trials of each and collectively that data predicts whether or not you have dementia. But in order to do that with something like brain imaging, it would mean I want to tell the brain activity for that working memory task uh, using only a few few trials. I can't do spend 30 minutes collecting data with that because then I wouldn't be able to hit the other trials, the other the other domains. And so the idea that we have with multimodal is can we start to use multimodal to get more power from fewer trials so that we can actually start to do those kind of experiments. Uh, does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, definitely. And then this, it would apply to FNIRS EEG as well, of course. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And that's that's the FNIRS EEG is what we're particularly thinking for the clinic because obviously those are two modalities that we can do in the clinic um, cheaply. So. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, next question um, was about the customization of NEARS toolbox. Is it possible to add any custom functions um, to uh, toolbox? Yeah, sure. Um, so so um, it depends on how good you are at, at coding, uh, but the toolbox is completely open source. And it's it, it's on GitHub. It's on it, we have a redundant uh, repository on Bitbucket uh, for historical purposes, but let's say the GitHub one. Um, you're very welcome. Anyone is very welcome to create a fork, um, uh, make their own repository, make their own changes. If um, you, you know, you talk to me and say, "Hey, I have this great uh, this great method," you know, we're happy to integrate that in. Um, I, I don't want it to explode with like a whole bunch of, uh, but you know, if you've if you've created stuff uh, and you want to integrate it, it to become the main part of the main toolbox for everyone to use, I'm I'm very willing to work with you to kind of work with people to integrate that back in. So so if you want to build your own custom code and stuff like that, um, I am more than willing to help you understand how to do things in the toolbox. Uh, at that level to kind of create that custom code. And if you want, I can put it back in. Um, with that said, we've also, um, there's in the nearest toolbox, there's a, oh, am I still sharing my screen? No, I am not. Um, no, I can ask. Um, uh, well, that's okay. I, I, I don't okay. need to. Um, okay. But there's there's a module. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna, It's it's not worth sharing. Um, but there's a uh, nears.modules. There's one called Run Homer, or Run Homer 2, or something. But it can actually it takes in any almost any function that Homer 2 can run, and it will run it in the excuse me in the context of the nearest toolbox. So you could run say my 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 resample, my bandpass filter, Homer's motion correction, and then my GLM as one pipeline, and it allows you to do that. There's also a function called run MATLAB code, uh, which just if you have kind of a MATLAB function um, has to have the right inputs outputs, but it'll call that. And so you can you can very easily just create your own functions that and integrate them as part of my pipeline. Um, so. Got it. Great. Um, the next question um, in the last webinar we had used um, LSL Lab Recorder to record the data. And I know you'd, you'd mentioned that you're still working on improving like the options for loading in data, um, but just wondering if you have experience with the XDF format and if that might be able to be loaded in the toolbox. Um, I can, if you give me a sample of it, I, I can, um, uh, I can integrate it. Um, would this be um, mm -hmm. for a context of multimodal or coming off just the NIRX systems? Well, this is coming off both. of um, Lab Recorder, the LSL kind of um, yeah. repository. But, but, so Brain Vision Systems would use it. Um, okay. Any, any EEG system could use it. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've played with that that f format a, a bit. Um, mm -hmm. One of the challenges was, um, well, I, I mean, it's it's it, it like if you have a NIRS data set. Right, it's number of channels by time, but you have no probe information stored in that LSL 
format. And so it's kind of the same thing with EEG. It's kind of missing some information to import that would have been in, say, the Brain Voyager or the Brain, uh, brain Vision files that are mm -hmm. not in that LSL. Uh, so header information. Uh, that's always kind of been the challenge. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's I. You would just have to the load function would have to have like a, an additional input, the LSL file, but then some additional header that tells you the probe geometry or something. Um, but we could do okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll work on. We'll send you a data file. And yeah. We can work on that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, another question here. I'm just going to read it verbatim. In your joint statistical modeling, have you tried incorporating data from systemic physiology, such as cardiac, cardiac and respiratory um, activity? Um, so, um, that's, so, so, so the joint, uh, so, so right now we have, there, there's actually, what I talked about was the joint imagery construction stuff. And the way that the joint imagery construction stuff works is it's a second level statistical model. So you take the time series of the NEARS and, and, or the EEG, you run a first level model of that. So you get the human dynamic response or the ERP response. So you get that statistical model um, at you know, one value of beta per channel or something, and then you reconstruct that. So right now my image reconstruction doesn't have time as, a, as an access. It only, it only does kind of channel to, to image space. Uh, so the, the physiology type stuff would be a first level model. Um, so putting that into the GLM in some way to kind of remove it that way uh, as a time series. So we do have that. You can you can take the systemic physiology, you can load it up into um, um, it, make the time course of it, introduce that into the GLM model. So there's a field in the in the data called auxiliaries. And so if you load it up into the that auxiliary field, um, there's a function. Uh, that basically takes anything that's in auxiliary and moves it into a regressor for the GLM. And so you can do it that way. Um, it's the same set of code that we use for like short distances um, to, to do the short distance um, regression and stuff like that. So you can do it, you can do that. I don't have any code for that for the EEG side of things. Like um, often in EEG, what you might do is you do the principal component analysis. So you get all these components and then you compare it to iBlink EOG data or something. You say component number five is the one that's most correlated with EOG with this external measure. And then you remove it that way. I don't have any code that does that uh, quite yet, but um, it's, 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 not hard, it's not hard to do. Um, um, some of the kind of the purpose of putting the EEG and, and fMRI into the toolbox was to start to get at these multimodal. If you were just interested in just EEG, uh, obviously there's other packages that do just EEG and that probably do a better job than I do for just that. But the idea of getting it into the same toolbox allows me to kind of start to develop these multimodal uh, because all my data is in the same format. Um, and that's kind of where we've been focused on that. So then perhaps could someone do that in first level stuff in a different toolbox and then bring it into your toolbox? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd have to, it, depending on what they're, well, so if it's, um, say, using um, the Brain Vision software for their pre-processing, I think you can save it back as a, whatever that is, BVR file or whatever. And mm -hmm. so you can pre-process it there save it and then import it and it's already been pre-processed. Uh, if you're using something like EEG Lab, I'm not sure what EEG Lab allows you to save data as. Um, although I could probably just call, I, I could write it like an EEG Lab, MATLAB converter or something. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that that's kind of a specific ask me, like send me an email or something and give me more specific details. And I'm I'm happy to help you figure it out. Um, so, uh oh, I think Ashlyn froze. Um, Hello, I'm here too. Uh, if okay. she can't come back, Ashlyn, are you back? Can you still hear me and see me? Uh, I'm we can. I, I'm, we I might be breaking now. up here. I can't. We do okay. hear you. We'll just. 
Yes, we uh, can keep things going along. So, um, oh, there you are, Ashley. Thank you. Please take okay. it away. It might have been a small blip. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let's see. Um, is it feasible to use EEG, fMRI, and NIRS for a cognitive task? So, um, yeah, I mean, you can. Um, cognitive, ta cog cognitive tasks are a little bit tricky uh, because the way that you analyze it with the EEG in terms of the timing is a little bit you know, if you're doing like NBAC, for example, you'd have an ERP to the presentation and you'd probably have an ERP to the response period. And, and so you, you kind of have to break up um, into the, the design of a cognitive task for EEG is, is often very different than the design for an fMRI and NIRS. Uh, so as long as you kind of have that in mind, um, and as I said, with the, the media nerve task, what we did was we did kind of conventional ERP to each individual event for the EEG and the MEG, but then kind of a much more block design, uh, kind of lumping everything together for the NIRS and the fMRI. Um, you might have to do something like 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 that, um, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't do it simultaneously. Um, there's a question of why you might want to, because um, it's going to be a lot more challenging. But um, I mean, I guess one way you could do it is you could think in terms of, uh, from the EEG data, maybe extracting some sort of feature in terms of um, these trials, the reaction time was was slower or something like that. And kind of you look at that from an EEG perspective, extract some sort of parameter related to the brain activity that's capturing that at a temporal scale that the NIRS or the fMRI couldn't see. And then you're using that as a regressor of, you know, these based on the EEG, these blocks were different than these blocks. Did the fMRI also look this, this you know, uh, show similar patterns or something? So you, you could come up with something like that in terms of your experimental design that really couldn't be done if you didn't do it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, but three, I've done three modalities simultaneously, and it was a, it was not easy. Um, so, so it probably goes exponential with the number of difficulty goes exponential with the number of modalities you want to use. So, as a support personnel, I can attest to that. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, next question. Um, did you say, did you say stimulated the median nerve? You stimulated the median nerve at four hertz. What were the maximum lengths of individual stimulations? And oh, um, I think each. Um, each, I'd, I'd have to look it up in the paper. Um, I want to say it's only like 50 microseconds or something. It's really short zap. Um, um, I, but I, I'd have to look it up in, in the paper. Um, okay. All right. So we'd pretty much refer this user to the paper then. I think they yeah. are very interested yeah. in that, um, proposition. Okay. Well, we're nearing two hours here, so we'll, we'll definitely just about wrap it up. Um, I'll just grab one more question here. Um, is it possible to see optodes and electrodes drawn on the same montage layout in the toolbox? Um, I can work on it. Um, I, I'm trying to think what happens if there, there. I have them both in uh, the nearest dot probe. If it's registered, you can draw it in 1020 space or in, in kind of the surface of the brain. And I mm -hmm. think if you just say hold, like you say nearest probe dot draw and they say hold on so that it doesn't uh it doesn't erase the image and they say eg probe dot draw i think they'll end up appearing in the same on top of each other um but i i can i'll look at it i know i have a um i have a probe class that i started writing called multimodal probe that actually a little bit better integrates uh rather than having a nearest structure and a EEG structure that actually integrates them both. And I think that will draw it, but I, I have to write a demo for, for that. Um, but it's, it's, to, it's totally possible. And I'll probably, it, while I'm fixing my EEG toolbox over the next few days, with all the things I discovered were wrong with it, trying to make demos for today, um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll definitely add that as a, as a feature. Okay. So. Okay, great. Um, let me just ask one more question, if that's okay, because that was sure. a pretty quick question. Um, 
so this user asks, I wonder if the noisy channels that would eventually be excluded in the pre-processing of EEG are adequately, adequately attenuated using the high ketosis filter to the point that they do not produce type 1 errors in the data. Um, so, so um, yeah, I mean, well, so the ketosis filter, the way that it works is, so there's the PCA or the ICA, uh, but it, it, it doesn't do it on a per channel basis. It takes, let's say, the 32, 31 channels of EEG, does a PCA, so it's finding um, the strongest, it's finding the strongest spatial component and so on. It's a spatial PCA and then does kurtosis on that. So you're trying to find, so it's really kind of designed for eye blink where you've got a huge spatial component that all showed the same sort of kurtosis associated with the eye, the eye blink. Um, it probably would work if you had a really strong component that was just like, so if it was only affecting a single channel, it would be one of those later principal components uh, uh, because it's only affecting a single thing. It's not a spatial, um, but it should downweight it. Uh, it should downweight it. And then when you rotate back, now that data has been cleaned up. Um, so it, sh it should work. It's probably not the most efficient way to do it, but it should work for, for that. Um, so. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, thank you very much. We've gotten a lot of very positive feedback, very brilliant talk, um, very informative along all aspects of this EEG FNIRS continuum. So thank you, Dr. Hubbard. Um, I just reminded everyone the slides, um, Dr. Hubbard, can we grab those slides from you? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll email them to, to you and then you can distribute. Perfect, Perfect thank you. Um, we'll, we'll give out the slides and we'll put up the recording in the next few days. Um, and just an, an um, announcement to everyone else, we've got a number of webinars coming up in September um, on um, toddler and, and child imaging and in, in infant imaging, as well as um, mobile imaging as well in October. So we hope to see you there. Thank you everyone for joining and have a great day. Thanks, Dr. Hubbard.